Hi, this is Karen Brown. Thanks for checking out the Mississippi Edition podcast. If you like what you hear, click subscribe, hit like, or leave us a comment if your app has that feature. Then find other MPB podcasts by searching MPB Think Radio on your favorite podcasting platform. Thanks. Good morning. It's 830 on Wednesday, August 4th. I'm Karen Brown, and this is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. On today's show, our conversation with State Health Officer Dr. Thomas Dobbs continues. Then the Board of Education takes action against the Holmes County Consolidated School District. And after a Southern Remedy Health Minute, UMMC helps develop a new weapon in the battle against COVID-19. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Yesterday, we heard Dr. Thomas Dobbs address staffing and supply issues within the Mississippi's hospitals as COVID-19 cases surge. Today, the state health officer turns his focus to changing science. New CDC research indicates a non-trivial percentage of vaccinated people can still transmit the Delta variant of COVID-19. That revelation compels some public health officials to walk back prior guidance and messaging. That's the real challenge. And, and that's one of the reasons why CDC offered these new recommendations for masking so that those sorts of situations can be you know, accounted for. It's just the way that the biology is. I, I hate that the, the mask thing has become uh, such a, a point of contention. But, you know, other things, too, like mass gatherings and stuff are, are so very important to be to be careful. I, I really do want to reinforce that point. But if we had more people vaccinated, if you had somebody who was vaccinated and had some virus with another vaccinated person, it's that double layers of protection that make all the difference. And we're seeing that, you know, the people who are hospitalized, who are severely ill, especially the younger ones, if we look around the state and see our 30 and 40 and 50 year old folks who are in the ICU, they're all unvaccinated. We haven't had a single death in a vaccinated person under 50. And we've had a lot of deaths and we're going to see a lot more in 30s and 40s. If you talk to the ICU doctors across the state, what they'll tell you is it's almost entirely unvaccinated folks who are on life support in their ICUs. And they're a younger age group than they saw before, 30s, 40s and 50s without significant underlying medical issues, except for maybe, you know, hypertension and overweight and some of them with no medical issues whatsoever. How do you feel about the national messaging? I was reading an article and this writer said that it would be effective if the national experts would say, this is what we know now. It's likely it may change, but this is what we can tell you now. But as we learn more, we will share more so that people don't cling to one thing that is said and get confused. Yeah, and, and that's a real tough one, too, because it's really easy to take an anecdotal situation and turn it into sort of a, a broad a broad set of beliefs. Can someone who's been vaccinated get COVID? Yes, it's always been that way. Can someone who's vaccinated spread it? Yes, it's always been that way. It's just a little bit worse with the Delta variant. But is the vaccine extremely effective at protecting you? Absolutely. Is it effective at preventing transmission? Yes, not quite so good. But if, if we'd had these performance characteristics in a vaccine from when we were looking at a vaccine, if you remember, we were hopeful about a 60 to 70 percent effective vaccine. What we have now is a 93, 95 percent effective vaccine at preventing severe illness and a two thirds effective at preventing any sort of viral shedding. And we would have been ecstatic with that a year ago. And I think the goalposts have moved because our expectations are so high, but it's still it's really effective and could get us out of this mess if we would all just ramp up and get more folks vaccinated. Are you getting any word on how long it may take to have one available for children? We don't know. We anticipate it'll be a stair step. You know, I wouldn't imagine we would go to very young children. It might be something like eight to 12 year old would be the next sort of cohort. But we know data has been submitted and would hope, be hopeful that maybe within the next couple of months, there would be an opportunity for parents to get their kids in that age group vaccinated. And at this point, in your mind, what does it take to rebuild trust? Because there's just so much confusion and some resistance, whatever it is. You said people do have excuse after excuse. What will it take? Just to be clear, some folks will never be convinced that it's the right thing. We've seen a social media environment that is so fueled with lies and disinformation that we've almost poisoned the minds of so many folks. 
so that that's really difficult. There are a subset of folks who are just kind of cautious and wary, and they see these things and they ask questions. But it, it's really, I think it's a it's a longer, broader conversation about making sure people are empowered to make the right decisions. I, I have seen personally how disinformation really can go and undermine just the simplest truth. One of the things that's very difficult is it's a lot easier to believe a simple lie than a complex truth. And when we think about how easy it is to say you can still spread the COVID virus if you're vaccinated, and that just sounds like, oh, it's useless, versus the complex truth of it can happen, it's uncommon, and it's highly protective, that's a lot more complex message. Now, this is really more of a foundational thing with health literacy and trust of government institutions that needs to be worked on for generations. So is this how life is going to be because we can't get to immunity? Well, we'll get to immunity one way or the other. I think we've just chosen the more painful pathway. What does that mean? Well, we're going to have a whole lot of COVID cases over the next month or two. If you look at the r naught value or the infectiousness, and, and I know this is really a simplification, you really need about 85% of the population immune to really have this sort of population level immunity that would prevent exponential or significant growth in cases. We estimate that maybe we have about 55% of the population that has immunity right now. So you got to figure that we've got a, like another third of the population, a million people who are going to need to be immune to get us to that threshold. And there's two ways to get there. You can get vaccinated or you can get COVID. And the Delta variant, which is highly contagious, is spreading rapidly. It's going to spread even more rapidly in coming weeks, most likely. And we're starting to see evidence that it's more deadly. And we're seeing more and more folks who are younger who we didn't see before. And so there's a growing concern that the Delta variant actually is more pathogenic, especially for younger folks. So if we don't get them at 85 percent and people are dying from this, we're going to see more waves. Yeah, or one long, painful wave. It's hard for me to overstate how tough this is going to be. I think if you're at home and you're going to baseball practice and you're not sick right now, it's hard to see the perspective of what's really going on in the hospitals, of the misery that we're seeing, of the young people's lives who are going to be lost, the people in their 30s and 40s. We know from the past year's data that of all the people who go in the hospital with COVID, around 15 percent will die. That's a huge chunk. And if you go in the ICU, it's about a third of folks who are going to die if you get COVID. We're going to see a lot of sadness. We're going to see a lot of personal tragedy. And it, it, it tears me up and wakes me up in the night, middle of the night worrying about it, what more could be done. But it's here now, and we're just going to have to deal with it. Is there anything that I didn't ask you that's important to point out? We still want folks to get vaccinated, absolutely. But Keep in mind that it's going to take about five weeks, even if you do the vaccination as quickly as can on schedule, to be even, you know, protected with your immunity. So those extra measures you can take on yourself to protect your family are very important. I can tell you that I'm avoiding indoor social gatherings. When I go out to eat, I eat, out, eat outdoors pretty much, and I wear a mask in public. And all my family members, both within my nuclear family and extended family, are vaccinated so that when we're around each other, we're safe. I think having a family-centric approach where you take care of your own is going to be very important in these next month or two. Dr. Thomas Dobbs, our state health officer in Mississippi, thank you so much for your time and sharing your knowledge about this. I thank you so much for having me. The state health officer there speaking again with Desiree Frazier. Coming up, Holmes County Schools face state takeover. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. This is Mississippi Edition. I'm Karen Brown. The State Board of Education heard yesterday from representatives of the Holmes County Consolidated School District. A recent state audit exoriated that district over misappropriated funding, unlicensed teachers, and poor record keeping. Holmes has received an F grade every year since 2015 from the Department of Education, and it's currently in violation of all nine of the board's accreditation policies. Deborah Powell was hired in May as the district's school superintendent. She told the board Holmes had gained positive traction under her leadership. I was so hurt from what we learned 
that have been happening in prior administrations or not happening that should have been happening for the children. The more we got into it, the more hurt I got. And then I absolutely, I'm going to be frank with you, I got angry because we did not have to fail the children of Holmes County the way we had done it. But I turned that anger into determination. I began to look at things that were taking place prior to sitting in the seat. I began to put together a plan, a strategic plan that included everybody and some changes that were taking place. Those changes included administrative reshuffling, which Powell says addressed some of the district's long-standing issues with accounting and special education. Clarence Webster, who's legal counsel for the district, told the board Powell deserves backing from the state. You have someone who has a track record as a principal in proving scores, who's gone out and recruited a dynamic staff, who's working hard, who in 77 days has done for Holmes County what folks haven't done in years, the first person to have a library budget since that school was consolidated, the first person to do a big new textbook buy since before that district was consolidated, the first person to enter the data in the PGS since that school district was consolidated. You don't want to have MDE use its resources, its technical support, It's oversight to come and help those people. Ultimately, the Board of Education wasn't moved. Shortly after Webster spoke, its members voted unanimously in favor of a recommendation to topple Powell, abolish the school district, and turn its operations over to the state. That recommendation now awaits the signature of Governor Reeves. School Board Chair Rosemary Altman spoke after the vote with MPB's Ashley Norwood. Well, any time the board has to uh, go into a district and make such a drastic decision, it's always not without a lot of angst and a lot of research and a lot of concern because you're dealing with with a community and with uh, children. But you have to weigh the uh, importance of quality education against the emotional side of, of the issue. And I know you heard a lot today from the Holmes County District. Why not choose any other option? Was there a particular deal breaker for the board or or a number of deal breakers? Well, the standards that we have set forth for school districts, when when all nine of those had been violated, when there was many financial questions as there are there, when there is many questions about their uh, teaching staff and their ability to find qualified teachers, the safety of the buildings and the safety of the buses, those impact children's lives as well as their educational ability. So, yeah, that's, it's, there were so many violations that probation wasn't going to work, any other type of uh, avenue that was available to us. So, the emergency declaration was the right way to go. The attorney with the school district, he said that MDE has failed Holmes County. Does, does the board in any way take responsibility for anything that's transpired over the years? Well, I think it's always easy to uh, blame the, the person that uh, is trying to make the decision. MDE has offered any number of supports and services. They have placed a financial advisor in there. Uh, We've had people up doing training. Uh, They offer webinars. They offer all kinds of uh, training. Mississippi School Board Association offers training. Mississippi Association of School Superintendents offers training. And so MDE has done what was available and what would be the, the district would allow them to come in and do help with the situation. The board recommends that Jennifer Wilson, who formerly led the Greenwood School District, be installed as interim superintendent in Holmes County. Coming up after a Southern Remedy Health Minute, UMMC helps out in the fight against COVID. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Deep South Dining is the show all about the culture of Southern flavor. From fried chicken and collard greens to shrimp and grits and a glass of sweet tea. Subscribe now to the podcast using any podcast app or download our MPB public media app. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Karen Brown. 
One of the more confounding traits of COVID-19 is the apparent randomness with which it strikes. In some people, it causes mild or even imperceptible infection. In others, its effects are deadly. The University of Mississippi Medical Center helped develop a new nasal swab test that aims to forecast the severity of COVID outcomes, even in pre-symptomatic patients. Dr. Sarah Glover led the research. This was the brainchild of myself and my colleague, Bruce Horwitz, who's a pediatric emergency room doctor at Boston Children's. And Bruce has had a long-standing interest in how viruses affect the nasal mucosa in children. We're both immunologists, so we both are mucosal immunologists. I'm more of a gut immunologist, and he is more of a, you know, a respiratory immunologist, but we're both immunologists. And so this was an area of mutual interest. So when the pandemic hit, we both said, this is an important thing that we need to study. We need to understand the mucosal immunology in the setting of COVID because people are getting super sick. And it's, you know, people are looking at the easier things to look at, which is looking at blood and looking at some of these other things. But how do we get access to the mucosal immunology without increasing risk for a patient population that's already really sick, right? And our answer was the no swab. On those tiny little scrubs, you get thousands of cells. And in those cells, you can look for the messages that those cells are sending out or the messages that are up or down regulated in those cells. I want to stop and you can you tell just what... a second. Why is it that nose swabs are used to detect COVID? Why not a throat swab or some other method? Just because that seems to be the viral entry point, essentially, in the nose. So it would make sense, then, for you to test those cells precisely because that's right ground zero precisely. for covid that's the ground zero for covid essentially so tell us about who you studied and the factors so involved you, you go to war with the army you have not necessarily the army you want so we utilized you know the group of people that we had that we spent a lot of time talking to patients and their families to get them to agree to participate in this study. Um, And, you know, some of the patients were very ill. So that was a really important thing to me to be able to, to connect with patients and their families. So even if they said no to the study, I wanted them to feel like somebody cared about their family member enough to even call them out. You were actually testing people at various stages, like someone might have just been Correct. tested. Correct. So yeah, no, we did not do, yeah. So we had people that were mild COVID, So people that didn't have very many symptoms, some of them didn't even have to go in the hospital. We had people that were mild to moderate. So they were in the hospital, but they weren't in the ICU. And then there were people that were in the intensive care unit and very ill. Dr. Glover, we've heard all along, or at least pretty early on in the pandemic, that people most at risk of having complications are the obese, older people with diabetes or cancer or other autoimmune disorders, that sort of thing. Does this trump those? I think that this helps us define the populations even better. So all of those things are true that you've described. I think the Delta variant is changing some of our perceptions because we're seeing a lot younger people. We're seeing people that, you know, we're seeing children um, get extremely ill from the Delta variant. But I think that this really helps us define populations because you sort of had an equalized population by the time you got to the severe COVID. So all of these people had all those risk factors, but then this was the added piece of understanding that we were able to gain. What are the similarities between the cells of those who become gravely ill? So one of the things that we get from these nose swabs is we got a lot of epithelial cells. And epithelial cells kind of line all of your mucosal surfaces, that, whether that be the nose, the mouth, the lung, the GI tract. Those are largely, there's a large epithelial component, and they're a really important part of barrier function, like so protection against the outside world or intrusion. And so we were able to look at a lot of those, and those are also part of what we call your innate immune response. So just, you know, kind of your basic immune response are, are epithelial cells. So what we saw, the biggest change we saw is that COVID induces a pretty significant ontological effect or it changes the landscape pretty significantly in those cell types. But in people with severe COVID, that change in landscape was even more significant. All right. In layman's terms, 
is so it, in layman's terms, it like basically switched around the the stuff that should be there. So you have what is normal, what we know is normal. It changed the makeup of those, how the innate immune responds in the nose. If someone tests that they're going to have severe illness or at least a likelihood of that, is there something that can be done immediately to offset those risks? Well, the biggest thing we notice in severe COVID is that there's this massive inflammatory response. And we can even tell this in the nasal mucosa there's a massive inflammatory response and it's largely interferon gamma driven. And because of that inflammatory response, intervening with some of those um, monoclonal antibody therapies, some of the other inhibitor therapies that are coming down the pipeline for people with severe COVID, I think it will help us ultimately risk stratify and decide who needs to get those therapies earlier rather than later. How far away do you think you are from that, from being able to determine those things? It depends on how quickly this technology gets picked up and, and how quickly you get the, the cost of it down, right? Because right now it's a little cost prohibitive, but I think this pandemic has surprised us. It's been amazing how quickly we've been able to get science done that we hadn't been able to get done quickly before and how quickly society and, and technology has caught up with us. Dr. Sarah Glover is a professor of medicine and the director of the Division of Digestive Diseases at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. It all sounds very fascinating. Thank you so much, Dr. Glover. Thank you, Karen. Thanks for listening to the Mississippi Edition podcast from MPB News and MPB Think Radio. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. And if your app lets you, leave a comment or review. We really do appreciate it. Remember, you can always get in touch with MPB News on Facebook and Twitter, and fresh episodes of the podcast are posted every weekday morning. I'm Karen Brown. Thanks for listening. This is Mississippi.